Claudia Angelelli, uh, it's a great pleasure to meet you here at the University of Arizona. Same thing uh, here. 6th of December 2012, so you know where we are. Claudia, what, what do you do in life, academically? Um, I'm a professor in Hispanic linguistics at the University of San Diego State University, and I also teach during summers in um, Castellón de la Plana. Oh, really? Oh, yes, okay. and the Universidad Autónoma. Okay. Right. De, de Barcelona. De Barcelona. Right. 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 Okay. Right. right. So you're in, you're not in a department of translation then in San Diego. No, but you no, do no, a no. lot in translation. No, yes. And, and uh, we have a program, a certificate mm -hmm. program in translation and interpreting studies, which mostly addresses practice. And then I have graduate classes in areas that intersect with translation mm -hmm. size, from issues and theories in translation or interpreting to issues and theories in bilingualism. Um, Spanish language and society, and then the research methods and the teaching methods where we have students that are interested in teaching language, Spanish as a second language, as a heritage language, or translation okay. and interpreting. So you're really doing a lot. This is one of the Not things. as much as I would like to, but no, yes. <laughs> on paper in the United States, actually now there are a lot of programs in translation, but even outside of the official programs in the right. conference, there's a lot of that translation activity right. being done. Right, yes. I think what's interesting in the United States, I, I believe, if we compare it with Europe, is that in Europe you have very well established schools of translation and interpreting. Over here we have few programs that are at the PhD level. We have some more at the master level, but we have a lot of people who are coming from departments like linguistics, communication, applied linguistics, languages in general, uh, psychology, cognitive, that are working on very specific areas and have done great work. So you have people who are known for their work in uh, interpreting in the courts, for example, mm -hmm. Susan Berg-Seligson coming from a department of linguistics and sociolinguistics. And so you get people crossing borders, and which makes it in educational linguistics. Education. Edu educational linguistics. Okay. Educational linguistics. You did your PhD at Stanford. Stanford. Right. right, right, right. So, so it's actually, not in a translation editing. No, it's, it's no, no, no. It was in yeah. a department of education in educational linguistics, focusing on language, literacy, and culture. Mm -hmm. And so I worked with people who are very, very um, well known in the field of bilingualism, translation, and interpreting. In the case of Guadalupe Valdez, Shirley Bryce Heath for language and society, Fishman for language and identity, and and my research was like bringing in the research, the paradigm from quantitative and qualitative. Mm -hmm. So working with anthropologists and sociologists was great, informing what I wanted to do. Okay, so you yeah. were constructing the interdisciplinary. Right, uh, right, right, right. Which is, I think, what we do as translators and interpreters do. I was bridging in between. Right. And and everything, yes. yeah. And, yeah. Right. Problem is being good at one thing. Anyway, right, right. You're back. You're not American. No, you Argentinian. American? I became Despite American. The yeah. Italian name. Right. My grandfather was Italian who went to Argentina, and um, never nationalized. And we spoke Italian, really? you know, at home. Okay. And then, yeah. But I, I so I did my. Um, whole education through university up to my BA in Argentina. Mm -hmm. My BA was in legal translation. Mm -hmm. So I knew that um, I wanted to study a language. I went to an English school all my life. And by the time I got to university, I had to pick a third language. And I didn't want to study Italian because I thought I knew it all. I was mm -hmm. a heritage speaker of Italian. I couldn't okay. read or write. So I picked French. And uh, so I graduated from university with a degree in legal translation. Okay, and, uh, yeah. uh, traductor publico. Traductor uh, publico yeah. nacional. And then right. you came to the United States? No, America? and then I started teaching. See, Argentina works in many ways like some areas in the United States where you can teach from practice, and that's how we teach in universities mm -hmm. over there. So I taught in three different universities, and then in 1990 I came to the United States to teach as a visiting professor at the Monterey Institute okay, of International right. Studies. Right. Right. And from there... And from there, when I was there... Because there is no doctorate in Monterey. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, when I was... When I was... <laughs> I know, yeah, I agree. Uh, when I was in Monterey, what I realized was that I was teaching out of experience, as, as we all do. And I was noticing that there were gaps I needed to address. And they have a very a wonderful, solid program in educational linguistics and language mm -hmm. teaching. Right. So I... As I was faculty in translation and interpreting, I was a student in the graduate program in TESOL. Right. So I, I graduated with an MA in teaching foreign languages, Spanish, and then I did a graduate certificate in TESOL and one in language program administration. 
So um, I really want to do that because the language program you administration. You're really doing it in the education side. Well, my interest has then, always then been. Your, your doctorate isn't that. No, isn't but but it does overlap mm. because when I go for my doctorate, I knew that I needed pedagogy in order to teach translation and interpreting. That's what I got mm. at the Monterey Institute. When I was doing that, I realized that there were questions I couldn't answer, and it was the asking and answering questions that that pushed me towards a PhD. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went to Stanford where you have no department on translation or translation studies. But as I said, working with a person who has worked on court interpreting specifically and on access on the part of linguistic mm -hmm. minorities to services, um, I did my PhD focusing on the role of the interpreter. I really wanted to understand. So that, when that, that, that's your book. The, the the, I actually original. got like two books okay. out of that. I kind of split. Mm -hmm. I went into looking at the role and I wanted to do understanding what triggers the participation of the interpreter, like the interpreter becoming visible in the interaction mm -hmm. through social factors. So for that I did the study uh, from Canada, US and Mexico and published a book with John Benjamins. Mm -hmm. And then the results of that study indicated that the most visible one is the one in the hospital. So I conducted an ethnography on that and that's published with Cambridge. Okay, you and should add a footnote that visible for you is Doesn't very different from like Benuti. No, 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 no. No. Means no, no, no. Visible yeah. for me means really that uh, the interpreter is addressed in talk, yes. intervenes, and what triggers that intervention. Mm -hmm. Some interpreters feel the need that they have to explain things. Some interpreters think that patients don't understand, and it's up to them to clarify. Some believe that the patients need access, and it's through them that they will gain it. So interpreters do many, many things with their talk, mm -hmm. and I was interested in understanding that. So that ethnography really looks at um, everything the interpreter does and focuses on the talk and through discourse analysis is, is looking at that visibility as strategies that the interpreters are doing to make themselves more and more uh, visible in the interaction, intervening more and more. All the way from, from saying, you know, good morning, I'm so and so, I'm going to help you, inter uh, help you um, talk with the doctor, all the way to replacing the interlocutor. Interpreters who have different careers and are medical doctors in their own countries and in code of ethics, okay, where people you get into say, ethical "No, that, that's here. what I, I want to address because I'm a co-author of, of one of those code of ethics, right. and it's easy to say, take off your hat of one, put yes. the hat of the when in sociology, you know that that's so not is it medicine. exactly. Yeah. And yeah. so what we need to do is is raise awareness yeah. on how do you do that, and what are the consequences if you don't do that. And so all of those things to me are of great interest. Okay. Just to, uh, as a general question, what? What sort of research do you think is needed in the United States with respect to translation and interpreting? So well, are there any, any particular areas that we... I think that we need, need um, I'm not sure it's different in the States than from Europe, I should mm -hmm. say, because I think that we need, um, we will always say we need more research, but we need research in the area, for example, of measurement and testing mm -hmm. and assessment. We started doing that, mm -hmm. but we definitely oh. see gaps measuring uh, from measuring quality, measuring the um, abilities, uh, capacity uh, to very measure. very difficult things to measure. No, they are, they are actually not. I think that the problem so far has been that they have not been defined. So we look at translation and interpreting at this art or craft that we are good at it or we are not. But if we define them correctly and then we say, okay, this is the construct we want to look at and so how are we going to address it? And we come up with rubrics that can address written translation as well as they can address interpreting. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been done a lot, but we, are, we have made progress and that there's still a lot more to be okay. done, especially adjusting that to industry as classroom and then research and how we translate research instruments impacts how we translate tests and we move um, students in high schools here or schools in general from one grade to the other through standardized testing. If that is translated rather mm -hmm. than adapted has consequences and how do we measure the quality of that translation. We need to come up with, with serious measurements to do that. That's one okay. area, but I think it's also valid for Europe. I think it's also the area of like the sociology of translation and mm -hmm. interpreting the, um, all those social aspects that I was mentioning before are really where, well worth pursuing. Same thing as ethical dilemmas. Um, I think we jumped again too soon when we say, don't do this, do this, do that. Mm -hmm. And I really wanna look at the interaction between 
code of ethics, theoretical um, principles and how they really permeate practice and if they hold in practice and if not revisit the idea of having code of ethics okay. coming from a description of you know empirically you driven. Much resistance? I mean you're an academic entering the world of professional codes of ethics. Mm, no Are because you I welcome with open arms. Well I ethics? have been working uh, with you know one of the things that I think I, I I do too much of is working, you can never do too much of bridging theory and practice, mm -hmm. but I've, since I began my career, I've always been taking part in professional associations so mm -hmm. that I don't okay. live in the ivory tower. And as I said, I co-authored the California Healthcare Interpreting Association Code, and it was interesting to me because it was the first time that we opened up a zone of like gray mm -hmm. areas and the interpreters can move from this extreme to that extreme and the, there's this range versus saying we can only do this because it's easy to rule it as I said in theory but if we were to take the time to research and bring empirical information to those code of ethics they would look a little different they, at least we won't be able to say take off this hat put on that if that's not possible okay. in any other case. Final point, you're, in addition to all the rest, you're now president of ATISA. That's right. Which is the American Translation and Interpreting Studies Association. Correct. Correct. I'm, I'm amazed you managed to fit everything in. No, that's but, part, that's part uh, of bridging academia that, and practice too. Is ATISA, are you managing to stimulate research uh, through that? I mean, is, is, it, is it... That was why, yeah, I think that yeah. was why ATISA, one of the goals of ATISA in trying mm -hmm. to bring the communities of researchers together in the United States and further the study of translation and interpreting. And it has been successful. It, it needs time. It has grown. We mm -hmm. have had a journal with John Benjamins yes. for 10 years now. And I'm, I'm delighted because it gives all of us colleagues in the U.S. a space that most of us in some cases are working in isolation or in pairs in different universities. We come to ATIS and we know every two years we have a forum where, you know, we can discuss our research and it's a lot more exciting than sometimes going to other conferences when you have a small strand on translation and interpreting studies and small audience. Claudia, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.